I indicated last night lay and lay liturgical changes in my examples are, and he embellished the traditional audio service when he restored it. And he brought in this and that. Uh, one of the earlier things he changed was he brought in kneeling for the consecration. The people had lost the habit of kneeling at the consecration. And, and he brought it in. And well, he, he had a, 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 a congregation of German farmers. I think in the, north, in the Midwest, you know that phenomenon of German farmers. And I mean, they're not always easy, malleable Anglo Canadians, are they? <laughs> so, and he had some really awkward characters in the congregation. He, he encouraged the congregation to say Amen in response to prayers. In German it's Amen. In English it's usually Amen, although I know some people who are very vigorously and loudly say Amen, and they sort of drown the rest of the yeah, yeah, congregation as they do so. Um, I don't see it. I, I do, yeah. Andrew's quiet, which is very <laughs> surprising. Um, anyway, the, this old guy refused to join in the Amen, and he said he wasn't going to do the pastor's work for him. So Luther <laughs> Leia had to work for a while explaining to people that they still are with their Amen, 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 or whatever it be. And uh, that's one of the changes he brought in. He bring, brought in kneeling. Some of the congregation objected to that and remained standing. So one Sunday, Leia turned around and he said, well, this is a good custom and of course it's a free ceremony, you don't have to do it. And he said, uh, but he said, I've forgotten the German word, it translates as Boers, B-O-O-R-S. And he said, but the Boers in the congregation uh, may remain standing if they wish. And from that Sunday on, they all went down. Now I thought I'd say a word about nomenclature. The, the words he uses for the right that our Lord instituted in the upper room. Uh, in these Abendmahl's credit, well really literally supper sermons, the most frequent term he uses is Abendmahl, Hajra Abendmahl, Holy Evening Meal. He will also say Holy Meal. He'll very frequently say just the sacrament, and if he's going to be a little more particular, he'll say the altar sacrament, altar sacrament, sacrament of the altar. On one occasion, when he gets into technicalities, he uses the term Eucharist in, in, in using a German version of the Greek, so Eucharisti, and he uses that really in a rather specialist way. He's not expecting the peasants to be saying that the next week. And then once at the very end, he refers to the whole liturgical order as Dimensi the Mass. Now, uh, I got into later studies, okay, initially at the behest of John Kleinig. I got to know John Kleinig in Cambridge in 1982 and have remained really good friends with him ever since. And he, to me, is a major spiritual father from whom I've gained an awful lot over the years. We were delighted to receive him and Claire in St. Catherine's a couple of months ago. And he um, began our academic year for us with a retreat. We invited him to come and do that, brought the academic year forward. And he responded and he said, well, um, he would be really tired by that stage of his American journey, so he'd rather not, he'd rather go home. And he said, but he said, because John Minger and I have produced a festival for him, he said, I owe you guys one. Tom remained silent, and I replied, yes, John, you do. <laughs> so he came, and he gave a wonderful retreat. But John Kleine, he, he comes from a, a different brand of Lutheranism. And the Almighty has senses of humor, because when you had two synods in Australia, John was with the ALC synod in the Lutheran Church of Bavaria, and he was very suspicious of Missouri. And he's turned into the leader of the conservatives there, 
a positive motivational runner. And uh, the chief proponents come from the old Missouri <coughs> of that church. So um, life is always much stranger than fiction. Now, he got me into Leia. And he got me a little bit into Vilma. But I've never really taken Vilma that far. But what really pushed me into Leia was that in 2008, we had that anniversary year, the 200th anniversary of his birth. And so there's a flurry of Leia stuff. The Luther Academy called a conference. They didn't have enough, but they, they published the essays anyway. And we ended up having two uh, elective courses at the St. Catherine Seminary in different parts of the year. So I got into Leia studies uh, in some depth. Now, at that time, I was just overwhelmed and flooded in my soul with the thought that Leia is the most relevant church father for our age. And I was reading, as I was reading him, I just had that impression. Uh, you know, dies geht uns an. Uh, this is absolutely directly of import to us. I don't have that overwhelming feeling in the soul right now. Um, but you know, uh, the truth doesn't depend on our feelings at a given time. Uh, anyway, I, I got into the later studies and a clergy widow in St. Catharines in the winter, in January, February of 1989. She gave me her late husband's three-volume layer biography by Johannes Deinser. And I took it and I realized one day I would read it. Well, that day came, 2008, for those intensive courses, and I, elective courses, and I threw stuff into the word processor and realized at the end of it, oh, I mean, there might be a book here. So I started a biography of Leia, which is now 56,143 words in length, or 141 camera-ready pages. Uh, I need to do some more research on Leia treatises and make sure I get the facts right. Now, the major scholarly lesson I've learned when you do Leia's research is you have to get your facts right. He's a controversial figure, and oftentimes it is said that he said, or it is remembered that he said, and it is maintained that he alleged. And what you have to do is go into the layer corpus or the biography with a fine tooth comb and check out things. And I find, I have impressions myself from stuff people told me, stuff John Kleinick told me, something I read 30, 20 years ago, and then, you know, now when I prepared this stuff, for example, I go back, check the original, and find out I got it slightly wrong. So you always need to check out your facts with the layer. Now, um, I think I told you yesterday that layer took an awful long time. It was a terrible uphill struggle to get a regular sacramental life back into Milan Dettel's arm. So that uh, when he got there, the custom in many of those churches in Little Franconia was you had a public celebration of the Holy Sacrament on a few Sundays in Lent and a few Sundays in Advent each year. And people would prepare, they would come, um, they might come in once or twice a year, that was it. And apart from that, there was no public celebration of the Sacrament of the altar. I assume later changed that overnight. But he walked in, you know, like some guy gangbusters out of seminary that, you know, keeps the health service going because district presidents get ulcers and all that kind of thing. And uh, I thought he came in and, uh, you know, just said, this is the way it's going to be, folks. Oh, come. In the 1844 agenda, he says, uh, you don't have a complete divine service if you don't go from the high mountain of the gospel and the sermon to the even yet higher peak of the sacrament. And I assumed, okay, he'd done this. Uh, no, absolutely not. 1851, he gets his congregation to adopt the cycle every third Sunday as Holy Sacrament. Now, that must have been pretty revolutionary in those country areas. That must have struck people as utter fanaticism. 
And uh, you know, even by the time his wife died, he had restored parts of the communion liturgy. But it wasn't until 1851 that he was able to celebrate the whole 1844 agenda of the altar of St. Nicholas. And that is basically page 15. You know, from that point on, you can do page 15. Now, and um, so you have that three weekly cycle. And after 1864, on Sundays when the regular service of the you know, chief time didn't have Holy Communion, he, he celebrated an early communion, which might have been an 8 o'clock communion or something like that. And you have the impression those who we would have considered the better ones in the congregation that he really brought along, uh, they were the people who would be coming to that early service. Uh, someone said jestingly, don't tell me again that Leo was a pietist. Well, a pietist, I think it means different things in different places. As a small boy, Leo saw his mother go for her uh, quiet time, die stille Zeit, every day, with a stark spread book. Well, I mean, you don't have to be a general in the Viet Cong, I don't think to appreciate Stark's prayer book. I mean, it's one of Reedon's badges of righteousness, isn't it, David? Yeah? And, uh, and then also, John Arndt had his little garden of paradise. Well, she would take these books, which were beloved of the pietists, and she'd go and pray these things. It's deeply in his soul. And the awakening at that time was a deeply pietist awakening. And there's one really eccentric way of thing. When Leo was in his university days, uh, he worked out, and it's from some, uh, from memory, it's 2 John 3.10, it might not be that text, he worked out, and you shouldn't have any communion with those who are not reborn. Because you remember, every congregation has those who are reborn, those who are awoken, and those who are neither reborn nor awoken. Well, Leia, in the typical pietist fashion, you forget to explain If I'm reborn, I know he's reborn. And he would walk around first, and he would refuse to talk to all the people who greeted him, because he knew they were neither reborn nor awoken. I think he got over that after a while. So, what that means, Andrew, is if you ask a question, I just don't reply. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah, he, he was my student for a number of years. We know each other quite well. And he's a kind of shit tell words or something. Now, okay. It took him an awful long time to get, to get going. And, um, okay. But after 1864, he has more sacramental life. And then the deaconesses got permission to hold public Sunday worship in the Deaconess House Chapel from Christmas 1859. So from 1860 on, and they had one Holy Communion service every three weeks. So he had rather more going on. Now I've got something here about um, pietism and I've overdone that now. So I'm not going to go back there. Now, Another caricature of Leia is he's said to have been pastorally heavy-handed or authoritarian. Uh, now, he certainly didn't think you actually needed lay people to transmit the office. He thought it should be done with their consent and approval, but he didn't think the call originated from them. So that's certainly true. Uh, after the year 1848, the General Synod of the Church of Bavaria brought in church councils, and you had officers of the church councils. Leo went very well with his church council, and the people on the church council were extremely supportive. And once he got a church council, he did something when people came to announce for communion. He had an officer stand with him, and if that officer knew any garbage about the person who was announcing, this officer would tell the pastor, you know, he drank too much beer last night and smoked a few cigars, so he really can't go to communion right now. But Leia and this officer would be on a homepage 
on issues of discipline and they tended to be. So, you know, after you overdo it with your beer and your cigars, you have to be awoken again. And it takes a while. <laughs> and uh, now today, of course, the situation is just entirely different. <coughs> that if we had lay officers sharing that responsibility, well, they have shock-up situations. Uh, today, you, you simply could not rely upon support from the mass of the lay people, could you? Uh, and that, the changes there, in terms of, you know, ethical situations, shack up situations, from the material world. That's changed dramatically in the 30 years since I've been ordained. Uh, and it just gets worse by the moment. But anyway, the last sermon here is on 1 Corinthians 14, 40. All things be done decently and in order. And he builds up into a big crescendo and he says, uh, what I'm doing here is not a one-man show. The pastor's responsibility is what a, not a one-man show. You share responsibility with me for the right celebration of the Holy Supper. And he really handles this home, and he has a very, very long Luther quotation from the private mass and the consecration of priests, which goes on forever now. But he says, um, you know, die Gemeinde ist für alles mitverantwortlich. The congregation is for everything uh, jointly responsible. So how you, you know, say, well, he is some authoritarian brute, it doesn't really work with Leia. I think people are then getting him mixed up with Grabba, who was sort of bad tempered. Um, and Grabba had two excuses. Number one, he was a Prussian. And so they were authoritarian from the start. And secondly, I mean, he'd spent a couple of years in jail. And if you've been in the King of Prussia's jail, you have a bad temper. Also. Oh. Uh, I think I indicated to you also, for many years I thought Leia was a receptionist. So in the biography I've done of Leia, I, I, I'm in the process of changing it. I said, despite everything, he really is a receptionist who believes the presence is restricted to distribution and reception. Um, I was talking to Matthew Harrison, and he, he came out with the remark, Leo wasn't a receptionist. Well, I mean, he, he's you know, way up there, and he has this loud, booming voice that comes at you. And you realize that, you know, dialogue, it's not possible under those circumstances. <laughs> and it wasn't really the time and place. I don't know how he came upon that, but actually he's right. As I said last night in jest, this is obviously a gift that came to him through the laying on of hands of Archbishop Ovare. He has this sure charisma of the truth. Well, don't tell him that. It wouldn't be good for his humility, I don't think. So anyway, um, even when I thought Leia was a receptionist, I'm going to see if I can find the quotation. I might be able to, or I might not be able to. Uh, see, Leia really, despite all his illnesses, he got a new lease of life when the deaconesses came to learn that was up. He intended to found a parish-based deaconess association. But what actually happened was, he founded a deaconess institute which got a deaconess house and became an institute, an educational institution and a care institution. And later, with the deaconesses, he was like this Roman Catholic priest who was chaplain to a nunnery. And I mean, he just loved hanging out with these holy chicks. Now, and then they went to confession, by the way. The average peasant in Nyan Nesselsal would be, you know, 10 to 15 minutes at most. Well, the holy chicks wanted all kinds of counsel, so they could be 35 to 45 minutes. It would take forever and a bit longer to prepare his deaconesses for holy communion. But 
this, I think, gave him spiritually a new lease of life. I think he was able to preach at a higher level and do stuff, and then liturgically he was able to do stuff. Now, the, the deaconesses did uh, two things with respect to the sacrament of the altar. First of all, they had a bakery and they produced sacramental hosts. Now, up to that time, a lot of, even of the Lutherans in Germany were using potato-based hosts, not wheat-based <coughs> hosts. And then they were just going to the confectioner's shop and getting something that kind of looked nice, but it, it was not wheat-based. Well, Leo was pretty uh, insistent that hosts should be wheat-based, wheat-based. So his holy ladies, the deaconesses, they made uh, hosts, uh, and I think until about 20 years ago they were still doing it. Now, I should be just about where I want to be. Uh, hmm. This is kind of irritating because, okay, um, one group of the deaconesses, they got into needlework, sewing, all that kind of stuff. And they produced paraments for the altar. Now, Leia said, if nothing is going on on the altar, you don't need to decorate it. But we're doing more at the altar. We have frequent celebrations of the Lord's Supper at the altar. So he gets very interested in colors and in symbols. And so some of his holy ladies get into paramount production. And that became, as it were, an industry in Bayern Nettelsau. And at one point, he had a, a, a paramount conference for the whole of Germany. And so all kind of holy chicks were getting together to do this stuff. Now, I'm really very irritated. Ah, good. <laughs> Good. Yeah, I find it now. Yeah. He's talking at Easter with the Deaconesses. For me, there is always something lovely and moving about a well-prepared altar at the celebration of the Holy Supper. Such an altar has something of Easter about it. So, now, Leia had, had a huge crucifix on the altar, of course. But he says, However little it may remind some people of a grave, it should nevertheless do so, for on it lie the white linen cloths, above all the chief of these, the corporal, in recollection of the grave clothes of Jesus. And um, then he says, the altar cloths are symbols of the grave clothes in which Jesus' dead body lay and from which the body of his glorification grows up. But they are more than symbols. As from the one set of cloths, his body was taken out to be then elevated to the throne of the Eternal Father, so from the other set of cloths, chiefly the corporal, the body of the glorified Jesus, your Passover lamb, is taken and given at the sacrament. We do not draw people to empty graves, rather, we seek and find, enjoy and experience the risen one at our altars and in the uncovered symbols of his grave clothes. They are to us a token of the sacramental presence of the risen one with his own. Well, he talks about you take the body from the cloths. And I thought to myself, that doesn't sound all well that receptionist. And, uh, it makes me recall, um, I remember years ago, I don't think I was there, but I was told about it. There was a confession symposium in Fort Wayne, and they were dealing with the sacrament of the altar. <coughs> Apparently, a reformed participant was impressed by a lecture given, given by an elderly professor there who will be nameless. But then he was really upset when Robert Price, who was presiding, said something about taking the body from the altar. Well, I mean, you know, Robert wasn't into three yards of lace and all that kind of stuff. 
but he said, you know, taking the body from the altar, which again doesn't go with perceptions. <laughs> now, Leia really gets into the issue in these sermons. And in one of them, you know, he talks about how, you know, the late dogmaticians speak, how most of the dogmaticians speak. And then he says, but you know, it's very clear Luther didn't think this. And he demonstrates it from Luther. And Leia is very gracious. He says if people are reverent in their practice, he won't break fellowship with them. So he doesn't see it as a fellowship breakdown. Um, but he, he very, you know, graciously says, this is my position and this is what I believe, this is what I teach you, and this is what we do, we have practice in conformity with it. And you pick up that if, you know, if he'd read all the 20th century scholarship, well, he wouldn't have had a shadow of doubt about it. Um, so, I, I, it, it's very clear, he broke with receptionists. I'm trying to find my outline to know where I'm going. Okay. Um, I'm quoting from one of the sermons. When the minister takes the bread in his poor hands and consecrates it to the most sacred use, and he'll use those terms, you know, consecrating it to a use, separating it for a use, which is very sort of Melanchthon, but he's got that from the tradition. When he does this, the bread becomes the body of which he speaks. And he's very um, insistent upon that. Now, yesterday I really emphasized how much Leia was an absolute workaholic. And uh, I'm not sure to what extent I need to repeat a whole lot of that. Um, I don't know how much Leia slept and how much he rested. Um, he's absolutely famous for the huge amount of visitation he did. And his visitation, I think he did it basically on foot, because most points of the parish would have been within about a three to four mile radius. You know, you would walk across fields, across footpaths. Um, he would get terribly muddy, and it must have been pretty rough in the winter. But he basically, as far as I can see, got around on foot. But I told you, he has St. Nicholas in my dental song. They had a hamlet in Bernsbach, and every sun Sunday evening, every two weeks, he goes to Bernsbach for a service. He used to like to do it in the winter with his wife. It must have been very lonesome once she died. And then in 1848, he gets a little neighboring parish that he takes over where he has a full schedule. Now, bear in mind he has the Sunday afternoon catechetical service. After 1864, he has early morning communion, main service, catechetical service. You might have stuff at the other parish. <coughs> Wednesday and Thursday, he has the weekday church services. Now then, you know, you have marriages, funerals, baptisms, teaching. Uh, he was a major teacher at the DPS school. He was a major teacher at the Mission Institute. And then, he wrote a tremendous amount. The man had the most amazing energy. Um, he started publishing already shortly after his ordination. He, he graduated, then he, he waited until he was appointed as a vicar. He did a couple of very brief, you know, just a couple of month stints as a vicar. He got a slightly longer stint in the Ordain, July 25th, 1831. And then he did a whole stint of vicarages which were really <coughs> assistant pastorates. Already then, he started to publish stuff. And 
I'd like to read some of this stuff. It's not all in the collected works. The pietist side really comes through one of his earliest things. You see, he was really into youth work. And many was in Kirk and Lamets. Saturday evening, the young men came to him. Sunday evening, the young women came to him. And they had several hours of devotions. And uh, you know, he thought the young people were getting a little too wild. And he published a little book called Dina Against Youthful Pleasure. I don't know if that's Dina, the daughter of the patriarch Jacob. I'm kind of saying, when young people whoop it up too much, it gets dangerous. I'd like to read the thing. You know, where he's telling young people, you know, to be working in the vineyard and all that kind of good stuff. Even really late in life, when he was sick and he, he, he had money from the royalties of his books, so his doctor would tell him, go to Switzerland or, or, or go to Carlsbad, you know, take the waters, rest up and all that kind of thing. And he did some traveling. But he was very worried because he said he must never forget his sacred calling. And he must always reach out for those who are far from the kingdom of God. I wasn't talking about you anymore anyway, directly. That was just a, <laughs> that was just a coincidence, good one. Yeah. But anyway, uh, the, um, yeah, you need to tell Brian about him. Yeah. Anyway, he was really worried that you know he would move it up too much. And so he was always careful you know, to witness to people who were far from the kingdom of God. He met some reformed people, he thought they were off all the sacraments, but he prayed with them. And he wrote this prayer book, Raphael, you know, the archangel who accompanied Tobit or whatever. And um, I'd love to see that prayer book. And I think if you translated it, it might be, be a holy snowbird. And he'd be saying, you know, if you go to Florida for the winter, okay, but you know, you must you know, witness to people and do good stuff and all, all that kind of stuff. So he, he's really into that kind of stuff. Now, um, I think I told him he homeschooled his three children, with the exception that after his wife's death, for one year, little Marianne went to Auntie Dorothy in Firth and spent a year with her aunt. Well, Leo would be doing all this stuff in the marriage, homeschooling his boys, writing books. Like at that time, he writes the agenda, does the three books on the church. And he wrote very long letters to his sister, instructing her about little Marianne's education. And Leo was big into calligraphy, beautiful handwriting. And so he insisted with his children that beautiful handwriting is a part of moral and spiritual formation, and that you can tell a lot about a personality from the handwriting. So you know, he, he's working his 18-hour days. <coughs> when he was a vicar in Kirk and Lamets, I think he said he started his days at 5 in the morning and usually ended at 1 in the morning. I mean, he did get a few hours sleep. And he really emphasizes, you know, how little Mariana is to write beautifully and all that kind of jazz. Now, um, let's move then towards the 1866 Sermons on the Lord's Supper. Um, I, I told you last night, in diary entries, between August 1859 and February 1860, Leia said he wanted to write a monograph, a whole book, on the Lord's Supper. And he writes down, he jots down 20 headings. These are obviously matters to be considered. And so that was an intention he had. And I don't think he published a huge amount of original material after that time. And of course, after he has his stroke in 1863, then he is increasingly incapacitated. He has to take, you know, months off to go to these various spa resorts 
And um, in the end, I think physically it was in a pretty sad shape. But now, what actually happened though was, in the summer of 1866, he devotes a whole sermon series to the Lord's Supper. And um, Pastor Peterson also has a book. I was telling me I think he's translated one of the sermons or something. And, uh, well, Leia is very deliberately trying to talk to the upper grade of his parishioners. As a good pietist, you know, he has the better parishioners who come several times a week. And there are the worst parishioners, you know, the really middle ones just come once a week. They are the fun. And then if they're coming, you know, every two weeks or every four weeks, well, obviously, they're not a welcome. And they need a lot of work. Now, he's preaching for that higher category. And that whole idea of the the higher category, that's pietist, except you do have people who are much more attuned. And much, I mean, you have lay people here who actually want to know something and get deeply into something, and they're not going to be fucked off with problem, which is kind of good. Now, he produces the Abdomal's Prelude. I think I told you, Leila became fascinated with the Lord's Supper in fiat. Fiat, in, today I think it's just part of Greater Nuremberg. But back then, Nuremberg, the imperial free city until 1806, and Fiat, there's some miles away, there's separate political jurisdictions. Uh, Leia was a Franconian patriot, by the way. He came from Franconia, he came especially from middle Franconia. He was okay with being part of Bavaria politically. You see, until Napoleon did his thing, middle Franconia was a multiplicity of jurisdictions. There was a, well, there were two jurisdictions which were run by a mark Graph. A mark is um, a, a border country, and actually the border country was Brandenburg, because the rulers were of the House of Brandenburg, so they had the title Count of the Mark, Mark Graf, Margrave. Well, we talk about Landgrave Philip of Hesse. He was a count of the land and they were counts of the um, border area, on the other side of which you, know, you have savage heathens. Um, now, so there were two of those things. And then Nuremberg was an imperial free city. Now they, had been, they were Lutheran territories. <coughs> what happened was in 1806, Napoleon set up the Rhine Bund, the Confederation of the Rhine, and the Holy Roman Empire then ceased to be, having existed for over a thousand years. It began on you know, Christmas Day 800. Uh, Charlemagne had come to Rome, the Pope backed him up, and there was a bit of a rebellion against the Pope. The Pope knew that the king should have a Christmas present, so Charlemagne is praying at the tomb of St. Peter, and uh, the Pope shows up and says, Happy Christmas, Caesar. You're now the Holy Roman Emperor. And Charlemagne became the Holy Roman Emperor. Well, that passed away. And the Elector of Bavaria, who is he's a good Catholic, but he's also a good real politician, he's into politics. He's an ally of Napoleon. And he was allowed to take Fürth and Nuremberg and these places in middle Franconia. And then, and then the Elector of Bavaria with the permission of Napoleon becomes the king of Bavaria. And in 1815 he keeps his kingdom. And he gets zillions of, well not zillions of, but quite a few Lutheran subjects. Now Leia, in 1849, I think he publishes so much. Uh, in Christian Leia, eh? you see, in the instruction on Sunday afternoons, 
He told the kids and the adults about the Reformation in Franconia. And he published that. He did a lot of original historical research. It's far beyond the level you could do with any Sunday school kid today. And he tells the story of you know, how Franconia became Lutheran. And at one point he says, it's good and right that you pray for the Bavarian kings. And we should pray for the kings. He says, I don't mind being a Bavarian subject. He said, but it's absolutely monstrous to say that we are of Bavarian origin. He says, no, no, no. We are Bavarian subjects now. That's fine. No problem. The king lets us do our thing. But, you know, we are Franconians. And he's an absolute Franconian loyalist. And for his martyrology, when he does the calendar, he works out the early saints and the evangelists, especially the deaconesses and whatnot, and those who get into works of mercy in Franconia. He puts them in his calendar. And so, again, when the deaconess house was dedicated, not only did they sing, Jesus, lead thou on, from Pan Sinsendorf, but they had readings about the holy deeds of these apostles and evangelists and deaconesses of Franconia. And some of those names went to the Iowa Synod, and I'm far from Iowa. So you had Zankt Zebald. Well, Zankt Zebald is some, I don't know, early bishop in Franconia that Leo wants to keep in liturgical memory. So, uh, but anyway, he, he's really into Franconian patriotism. Now let me tell you something. In 1808, the king of Bavaria discovers he has all these Lutherans and all these Protestants, and what do you do for them? It was a bit difficult for him, because according to the law of the empire, when you have Protestants, the ruler has to be the supreme bishop. And the king of Bavaria says, well, I can't really be the supreme bishop of subjects of another religion. And the lawyer said, well, sorry, majesty, you kind of have to be the law of the empire. And the king said, well, okay, tell me what to do. And he instituted in 1808 a Protestant total congregation, eine protestantische Gesamtgemeinde. And that means Lutherans united and reform. And they're all in the one church government. Well, obviously, the king of Bavaria has no idea what's going on. Neo-Lutheranism then started. And so one of the big things Leia does in the late 1840s is he says, we have to break out of the Protestant total congregation. And we have to be an evangelical Lutheran church. And you know, this has got to change. Now, there are ironies in history. When in the year Leo was born, uh, in 1792, he was born in 1808, but in 1792, the last Mark Graf of Brandenburg Ansbach, he, he was childless. I just read it like this. But he married a second wife who was an English woman. And he decided that he couldn't be bothered with ruling this little German principality. So he abdicated and he gave the territory to the kings of Prussia, who were the, the reformed kings. And uh, then he just retired, got a good pension, went to England and moved it up for a couple of decades. And just had a nice life with a royal title. And um, now, what happened with all the turmoil was, the king of Bavaria gets the territories from the Margrave of Brandenburg Ansbach. So Leia, uh, well, he, he could have ended up under the king of Prussia, but by the grace of God he didn't. And the Catholic king of Bavaria, so he had much more tolerance for Lutherans. Now, Leia had a string of writings in the late 1840s. There was a Bavarian General Synod of 1849, and his party wanted to have a separate evangelical Lutheran church. Well, the church government went absolutely crazy. They wanted to throw Leia out of the ministerium. Leia wrote a book called Our Churchly Situation, Unsere Kirchliche Lage, 
our ecclesiastical situation. And what the government in Bavaria, it wasn't a strong monarchy like Prussia. In Prussia, the king just decided how it was going to be, basically, till the end of 1918. And it didn't really matter what the parliamentary majority was. But the king of Bavaria was a parliamentary monarch, a constitutional monarch, and all major decisions had to be agreed between the minister and the monarch. So if the minister wanted to do something and the king didn't, or the king wanted to do something and the minister didn't, they had to have a cooling off period and they had to meet each other halfway. Well, there was a layman who was head of the Supreme Consistory who came in in 1851 or two, and he bowed low and he said, Majesty, we've got to get rid of Fala Leia and, and these radical ayatollahs who support him. You know, they all go, they fly off to the Fort Wayne Confessions Congress every January, and they behave as those who are neither awoken nor reborn. Can I get rid of them? And the king said, oh, well, okay, I'll think about that. Now, the kings of Bavaria, once they had the Protestant subjects, two kings in a row, married Protestant queens. The first one was Luther and the second reform. The kids were brought up Catholic. But what the king was doing, he was sort of signaling, well, I'm going to respect that segment of my subjects. Well, Max II, his wife was a princess of Prussia, so she must have been reformed. But Queen Marie, you see, he goes and he has you know, lunch with the queen, and he says to the queen, well, Marie dear, I've got to you know, sign the expulsion of Father Leia. Well, she had decided Leia was a good thing. She says, oh, no, dear, don't do that. Think about it. Well, King Max was a good friend of, in as much as royalty can be, of France, France, I told you about him last night, I've forgotten his name. Not Dalich, the exegete, it'll come to me. And, and he became the, uh, like, bishop figure from 1853. It's gone out of my mind. But he, he was professor um, in, in, he was from Erlangen, but he, in Nuremberg, and he was professor in somewhere in Saxony in Dresden. And anyway, the king writes to this Lutheran theologian, whose name must be in my notes, and I'm really ashamed I've forgotten his name. And he says, please give me some advice. And he says, the, the Protestants are having a big fight, and I, I don't want to do the wrong thing. And so anyway, the theologian writes to him and says, well, Majesty, quite a bit is going on. And the king wrote, read, unsere kirchliche Lage, our ecclesiastical situation. And so then he decides, well, maybe we need a distinct evangelicalism church. And maybe they should, the consistory should be headed by a clergyman. Who is that guy? I had his name yesterday, didn't I? You forgot it. Said young man is going like mine. <laughs> yeah. I said his name once. So. Okay, I said his name once. And anyway, what the king did is he then called him. And in 1853, it became officially an evangelical Lutheran church. And officially, there's a separate Reformed church. And officially, a separate United church. Well, it's kind of good that the Catholic king was the supreme bishop. Because without him, I think you'd have simply had a Protestant total congregation. Now, Leia still was unable to get closed communion. And well, Queen Marie wanted to visit Mount Gatimsar. And the king said, well, it might upset my Catholic subjects if I go and attend the service of Mount Gatimsar. And so it wasn't until uh, quite a few years after the king's death once Leia became a knight, first cross of the Order of St. Michael, the next year he came to Munich, and he had a whole day at the Royal Court, and he was scheduled for 10 minutes with Queen Marie. She was still evangelish, but she was the mother of Ludwig the Man, so she needed lots of comfort. And Leia had a one and a half hour audience with the Queen, and he gave her spiritual comfort, you see. And he did all kinds of things at the royal court. And as I told you, he really disgraced himself at the end of the day. He was so tired, he had a glass of 
Yeah. <laughs> now, they had this century in the sacrament of the altar, and you're all on board with that. Uh, in 1865, the year before he did his Lord's Supper sermons, he was at a clergy conference. I am still the same good Lutheran as previously, but in a more inward way. Earlier on, Lutheranism was to me tantamount to confession of the symbols from A to Z. I know you pronounce the final letter of the alphabet differently, but it's Canadian Thanksgiving Day, so it's from A to Z. But now, the whole of Lutheranism is contained for me in the sacrament of the altar. Now, what's interesting is for him, the sacrament of the altar is reality. Lutheranism is reality. It's not just a reality you write down on paper. It's a, a, an absolutely concrete, specific reality at front, altar, pulpit, and in the, in the human soul. But it's contained for me in the sacrament of the altar in which all the chief doctrines of Christianity, especially those highlighted by the Reformation, have their center and focus. So all the chief doctrines of Christianity, and he says especially the Reformatorischen. In German, Reformation is an adjective, which is not in English, so you can't really do the same thing. The main point for me now is not the Lutheran doctrine of the supper, but sacramental life and the experience of the blessing of the sacrament that is only made possible by abundant participation in the sacrament. My progress is marked in the words sacramental Lutheranism. So, well, in those churches where weekly communion has become a reality and people actually appreciate it after a while, I think they kind of see how everything kind of holds together and gets its focus there. But a focus which for Lutheranism, of course, involves strong preaching and teaching at the same time. So you can't get what you have in some high Anglicanism where there's no doctrine, but there's an awful lot of fuss and bother at the altar. Margaret has disappeared. John probably is better than Fred or having his diaper changed or something. My daughter Margaret married to Stephen Price. She and I went to visit. And Stephen was very gracious, let me take off his wife and his infant son to England for two weeks. England and Wales. And I um, went to see my alien mother. And one Sunday we went to the parish church where I was baptized, from which I was confirmed, which is now forward in faith. Well, they're the high Anglicans who don't have the courage to join Benedict's ordinariates. It's very weird, very awful, very pathetic. They were saying they had to be Anglican, but he had to use the Roman Mass. I'm thinking, go figure, Reverend Father, there's something real there. If you really need to be an Anglican, use the Anglican liturgy, please. And the homily was, pardon me, ladies, per frickin' theta. <laughs> it was really awful. I mean, the guy hadn't reflected on the text. There was no word of God. A German friend would say, as to as can the he got his thoughts, the Poor God's word was missing. There was just nothing. And then he announced an open communion policy, and I'm thinking, this has no integrity, whatever. Today, I think the only ones left in the CFB who have anything going for them are the conservative evangelicals. The Anglo Catholics have some kind of protection and structure. The conservative evangelicals have none. They have numbers and money, but not a single bishop. And today, they're the ones who are starting to be leading the protest against 
the sexual stuff and the ordination of the ladies' stuff. But boy, they had zero protection. But what was going on there was pretty awful. And we went to York Minster, and to an evening sign. Well, today, you have to take out a mortgage on your house if you want to visit an English cathedral. The Church of England gets no money for those things. So they charge money to get into Westminster Abbey, you know, costs you about a hundred pounds. The only way to get in free is to go to Vespers. So what you do is you go in for evening sign and you, <laughs> and you walk down as many aisles as you can and you take it all in. And you go to York Minster. And it wasn't too bad. But the Dean of York Minster is tipped to be one of the first lady bishops, the very Reverend Vivian Fowles. Andrew, she would be your kind of chancellor. Whoa! Well, a little John, I think he'd been fed, he threw up a bit of his mother's milk, and he got very squawky, and Margaret took him out. Well, no wonder, he's very well named that boy, John Roberts. And he squawked like crazy. Well, this chancel chick went in state to the high altar. She gave her blessing. Ooh, it was creepy. You know, blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But it started with, may holy wisdom, may she draw you to God. May holy wisdom, may she. And one point out there was a parishioner asked her afterwards to justify that. And oh, it was creepy. And she was giving her a blessing. Well, I thought, you know what, I'm not crossing myself for that. <laughs> so I thought, keep it, lady. <laughs> well, Mr. John Robert, you were having a good squad, weren't you, honey? Yeah. And he was he was offering his opinions. <laughs> Now, but anyway, that's Leia's view. Now, Leia had to deal with the issue. He says, we need the sacrament of the altar more. In many of the congregations in Bavaria, we call ourselves Evangelical Lutheran, but united people are being communed, and even reformed people. And what do you do? Well, I mean, there are some people in the area who, you know, come to Ryan Nettles are and on Sunday communion. And it's all like that. But what do you do in other areas? Well, Leia was ending up saying to people, well, commune. But you hand in a formal protest and say, you know, Reverend Pastor, I don't agree with what you're doing here. It's difficult. He says, a confessional life without sacramental direction in the congregation or without leading the congregation to the sacrament ends in a wretched orthodoxism and confessionalism that dismembers and splits the church. I think he's getting at Walther and Missouri and their view of doctrine. I think he's doing that. And in fact, in one of the statements that I might have, he explicitly does it and says, you know, we are real Lutherans and we're not like those Missouri people. Um, very bitter at that point. But he says, if you talk about, you know, we're very, very orthodox Lutheran, but we don't have the sacrament of the altar, he says, it kills true life. It sets in its place the conflict between scholastic opinions that cannot satisfy a single soul. Now, what's interesting, as Leia develops sacramentally, is the Holy Sacrament of the altar as a reality is absolutely front and center for him in areas where you might not expect it to be. At the end of 1848, 1848 was a revolution year in Germany. Uh, the king of France, Louis Philippe, the citizen king, he was overthrown. They got the second republic in France. In Central Europe, he had riots. I mean, the king of Prussia, he had a nervous breakdown because there was a riot in Berlin. Well, I mean, in hundreds of years, they hadn't allowed riots in Berlin. There was one in 1613 when they became reformed. 
I mean, the Lutherans got drunk, and some clergy got drunk and preached and, you know, said what they thought about the elector's religion. And, well, he didn't do that a second time. He <laughs> ran in good Prussia. Uh, anyway, you had these riots, and you had a parliament in Frankfurt, and it looked as though you were going to get a more representative government. The English historian Trevelyan said, it's the year when German history sort of got into a wheel of change and then the wheel didn't turn. You had a few months where things changed, then they went back to the old order anyway. I mean, the Germans were used to law and order and you it at all kind of stuff. Anyway, it looked as though you might get a church that is not run by the state. So Leia writes and writes and writes about our ecclesiastical situation. He writes petitions about close communion. And he wrote a proposal for a Lutheran association for apostolic life. And they founded in Bavaria the Society for Inner Mission. And the Society for Inner Mission, it was broken down into four compartments. One of them was we promote foreign missions. Another was we promote diaconate here at home. And we do various things. But Leia said in 1848, he said, too many of the Lutherans are only concerned with confession and liturgy. So these things are absolutely vital. But we must also holy living. So he produces this proposal for a Lutheran Association for Apostolic Life. Well, I mean, really, this is kind of, well, you know, we go to church multiple times a week. We tithe at least. And we do all kinds of stuff for the church in between. It's very obvious when you read this work that I've done twice that Schreiner is the godfather. Spina is Pierre de Zideria, and Leia doesn't mention Spina, but it's obviously he's trying to do a more Lutheran version of Spina, but keeping what he would think are all the good things from Spina. Leia refers to the blessed Spina. I've never seen Walter call him the blessed Spina. I mean, he'll speak with him without cussing. It's spitting. But I've never seen him say the blessed Spina. Now, for Leia, it's the blessed Spena and the blessed Simpson dog and stuff like that. 